Welcome back everyone. I hope you had a great lunch. I know few of you might be sleepy after meal, but now is the time when we are going to discuss about most exciting topics of the day from our industry experts. Before we start the session, I would like to read out some housekeeping rules for benefit of all. Request you all to put your gadgets on silent mode. In this session, we would be having two topics of 15 minutes each, after which we will discuss combined Q&A at the end. Audience is requested to please post their questions for respective speakers on Slido. The QR code for Slido is on screen. You can scan and post your questions. The topics which we are going to discuss are fair market value of life insurer and future of participating business. For this, I would like to invite our session chair, Mr. Pankaj Kumar Tiwari, general manager in reinsurance department of IADA, who will give us the introduction of the topic. Then. Along with him, I would like to uh, invite Mr. William Haley, Director at Moody's Analytics Japan, and Mr. Sunny Agarwal, Director and Consulting Actuary at Vidap Services. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon. Hope I am audible. and i know it is the most difficult sessions because food was very good and i could see the long queues in the food so people have enjoyed food but i will try my best to keep you engaging while we are discussing about our presentation my name is pankaj kumar tiwari i work with the regulatory office irdi and currently i am working in reinsurance department i have the pleasure to introduce two speaker one is mr william haley director at moody's analytics japan who will be talking about fair market value of life insurers before i proceed for the introduction of second speaker it is important and pertinent and relevant also to let me give you a brief about this topic i always wonder when we talk about market value it is transparent value but then why we add fair market value does that mean market care value can be unfair also but i have not seen this term market value is important in the context that as our industry is progressing lot of insurers they need capital and it is important that they should go to the securities market to get additional sources of capital further it is also important to assess fair market value because there are requirements of merger acquisition and it is important that an enterprise is valued in a transparent way i would like to thank our member actually sir who has very clearly spell out that what are the requirement for the insurer to ensure that when they are giving liabilities in their books in a transparent manner it is important that fair market value can be assessed and it is helpful in terms of acquisition listing and other thing as we know that there are a lot of reporting tools available or methodology other should i say like i for 17 solvency 2 market consistent embedded value i would not like to go into much detail because the audience present here is well versed of the terminology and we have limited time before i call mr william helly and he has the liberty that he if he want he can start from there or he can come here i would like to introduce our second speaker also whose topic is future of participating bonus participating bonus is also known with the name with profit business let me admit very clearly when i was studying actuarial science i was thinking both are different but then i found out both are same with profit and i don't know when they say with profit it is for the policy holder or for the shareholders and when they say participating profit it is for the shareholder or the policy holder but in both ways it is for both 
So in a nutshell, if a policy makes a profit, it has to be distributed in a predetermined manner. Future of participating bonuses, participating uh, business, I'm sorry, depends upon a lot of factors. And Mr. Sunny Agrawal, who is a director and consulting actuary at WebApp Services, will take us through. So to start with, now I would like to request Mr. William Haley to give us the presentation about fair market of life insurance. Welcome, William. Let us have a round of applause for him, please. Uh, th thank you for the, the, in the introduction and, and good afternoon, everyone. So as, as we've just heard, the proliferation of solvency or risk-based capital regulation along with IFRS 17 requirements has led to a global push uh, to move to a fair market valuation basis. So this shift has particularly impacted life insurers who have sold products with embedded options and guarantees. So this might be, you know, within the participating products we're going to hear about next, uh, which now need to be valued on a consistent or on a basis consistent with observable market prices. So today I'm going to focus in on one particular area, um, and that's in the challenges that arise from the need to value those embedded options and guarantees on a stochastic Monte Carlo basis. Um, and how insurers we see maybe in some of the other markets are, are addressing these challenges. So I'll very briefly ch touch on some core scenario generation. Um, sorry, didn't get the slides right. Um, I'll, I'll very briefly touch on some core scenario generation and market consistent valuation uh, concepts and then dive into some of the perhaps less obvious implications of the transition um, that challenges that maybe even insurers who are already doing market consistent valuation might be facing. Before we go into that, I just want to take a minute to touch on you know, why, why is this important? Um, why do we need scenarios and Monte Carlo simulation in the first place? So again, this might be familiar concepts, but um, to put it very, very quickly, um, this really becomes relevant, as I say, when we have policy holder options and guarantees embedded in those life insurance contracts. Um, and you might say, okay, we can value options with an analytical approach. So if you think about equity put and call options, we have black shoals, uh, we, can, we can value those options. But typically when we look at the life insurance liabilities, they're, they're much more complex. And essentially what happens is that we can't find analytical solutions to those problems. So we end up reverting, or, or the option we have is to revert to a simulation-based approach. Um, and of, of those, the risk-neutral risk Monte Carlo um, is the most widely accepted and adopted um, across most markets. So here we essentially use an economic scenario generator to simulate a wide range of possible future states of the world. Um, then using our actuarial cash flow model, we evaluate um, our cash flows, our outputs under each of those scenarios. And then by discounting to time zero and taking the average, we get an estimate for um, our, our liability value. Um, so there's some subtlety in the specification of the scenarios and the discount rates used there, but that's essentially the process. Um, as I mentioned, I'll, I, I mean, and that's essentially the process and, and the challenge, uh, I guess the reason that has significant implications is that if you are moving from a deterministic approach where you're using a single scenario to value your your liability, you may now need to be running that model a thousand or five thousand times to come up with your valuation. So, you know, the scale of the problem increases significantly. Um, I won't dwell on this because I'm sure people are familiar with, with some of the concepts here. Um, but by scenario generator, I, I just mean a set of models, um, interlinked models that let us simulate possible future states of the world. Um, these are stochastic models that allow us to incorporate uncertainty and randomness into those projections so that we can come up with a distribution that hopefully reflects all possible states um, of, 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 of the future um, state of the world. Um, and then we can use those in that valuation process. Um, there are a couple of different flavors of scenario models that you'll hear about. So there's real world, um, and then there's market consistent, there's neutral. Um, 
and I'll focus on the market consistent risk neutral, which is what we want to use for valuation purposes. Um, I won't go into the details of the differences between these two at the moment, but happy to pick that up separately. So with that, we can dive into some of the challenges and observations we've seen from some of the other, other markets. Um, so as I say, I'll focus in on the valuation problem and we'll come back if we have time um, just to touch on maybe some of the downstream implications of moving to a fair market value basis. So obviously if you're changing how you value your liabilities, then you know other downstream applications, your solvency monitoring, your capital calculations, your risk may want to reflect those changes too. Um, and obviously when you start doing that, you're again scaling up the problem. So there's additional challenges that, that need to be thought about. So in terms of broad challenges, I've, I've bucketed these into four general categories. So the first is your model and calibration choices and, and optimization of your configuration. So is my economic scenario model fit for purpose? Does it capture the features of the market that the liabilities I'm trying to value are sensitive to? Secondly, on a more, from a more practical perspective, um, the implementation and delivery of results. So is my production process robust? Um, as scenario production requirements ramp up um, to meet the new requirements that I've just described, can, can I produce the necessary, necessary outputs on a, on a timely basis? Um, there's then a, a bit of a conceptual um, challenge as well. So maybe if you're speaking to non-technical stakeholders, uh, there might be um, you know, some education required to get people comfortable with the new concepts, to get people comfortable with how you go about validating and justifying um, you know, a distribution or the validation tests um, to show that your liability estimates are actually realistic and sensible. Um, and then lastly, uh, and I've touched on this already with these other topics, is in, and it's a whole topic in itself, but embedding these approaches in the broader business as usual applications, um, and, you know, the, these downstream implications. So, I mean, I'm not going to cover all of those comprehensively, but I'll touch on a few, few different examples from, from each to try and give a um, a flavor of, of some of the challenges we've seen and how people have addressed these. So on model choice, um, you know, why, does, why does model choice and the calibration matter? Um, so our goal here is fundamentally to value our liabilities consistent with observable market prices. Hence, we want our model to have the flexibility uh, to be able to capture the market features that are relevant for our liabilities um, and our calibration to be able to fit to actual observed prices. If it doesn't do that, then it's not going to be a very good, good model. Um, so there's an example here just of a, um, a simple interest rate model where we have fitted to swap option prices. And you can see here that whilst we fit the at the money price, um, the model does not capture the skew in the market surface. So we'll either be over or under pricing our liabilities if those liabilities don't look like a swap option that um, is at the money. So if it's out of the money in any way, there will be some sort of error introduced to our estimate. Um, so we've, I mean, we've had a, a look at this, and this is just an example we put together for some uh, a Japanese uh, participating product example that we, we pulled together. And this just compares three different models um, and the liability result that, that's produced here. So on the left, we have what we call a LIBOR market model plus. So this is towards the more sophisticated end of the, the spectrum. And on the right, a one-factor whole white, which is a, a, a more simple model, similar to the example we just looked in the, in the previous slide. Um, and you can see that there is a difference here, right? There's a noticeable difference. Now, whether that's material will depend on your business um, and the nature of the products that you're valuing, but it's worth worth being aware that this, this, this can have an impact. Um, the other consideration here is that just the sensitivity of your liability values to changes in the market. So with the simpler model, we don't capture the skew. Um, so if changes in the skew happen, your liability values will not be affected and you won't see that coming through. So you won't necessarily be aware or understand um, that 
know, changes in market are potentially affecting your, your balance sheet. Whereas with the more sophisticated models, hopefully they can capture those sorts of features. You can be aware and you can try and manage to um, those outcomes. The next one's from more of a, a practical perspective. So um, this is an area, for instance, in Hong Kong, where most people have got their reporting processes pretty much nailed down. They've got the models set up and running. Um, and now they're saying, OK, I'm having to report on potentially multiple different bases. So I need to do IFRS 17. I need to do Hong Kong RBC, possibly ICS. So the number of scenarios and heavy model runs are doing or having to do are becoming you know, um, quite large. And management are saying, OK, I want to do this quicker. I want to reduce the resource that goes into this. Um, so that's, that's been a focus recently uh, and one we've been speaking to insurers about. So one way to kind of, you know, one simple way to reduce your, your, your workload there is to say, well, rather than using 5,000 stochastic simulations, I'll just use 1,000. Um, and clearly that has a big impact on, on run times. Um, but on the flip side, you obviously increase your sampling error, you have wider confidence intervals around your estimates um, and less certainty around, around those estimates. Um, so this has brought insurers to start considering, okay, what can we do about this and um, looking at variance reduction techniques um, that maybe help mitigate this problem. Um, so as an example here, we have three martingale tests. These all pass um, in terms of a standalone martingale test. Um, on the left, it's a 1,000 trial scenario set. On the right, 5,000 trials. As you might expect, it's much narrower, much tighter. It gives a better or closer um, estimate to the true value. And in the middle, we have a compromise where we've taken 1,000 scenarios and then run a reweighting. Uh, so we get the confidence intervals that are similar, but a much closer absolute um, estimate. So that might be, in certain cases, a, a preferred approach. Um, but the, the challenge here comes in uh, understanding or, or being aware of the, the, the broader implications of those changes. So if we look at valuing or, 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 or liability, we need to think about not just the Martingale tests, but a whole range of other criteria. And when we change um, you know, or adjust our scenarios with the variance reduction technique, then we can have other knock-on impacts on things like dependency structure, which might adversely affect the liability estimates. So there's a lot of work being done around different variance reduction approaches, methodologies, and the pros and cons that those bring, um, and how they compare or, or impact the range of validation criteria that you need to think about. Um, just a couple, couple more points, points. So I talked about uh, essentially stakeholder communication. So um, maybe you need to uh, communicate validation tests and new concepts to non-technical stakeholders. The other area of focus is from, I guess, both internal and external, is things like you know, stability of your balance sheet. So this is an example. It's actually just taken from IOPA of solvency ratios in, in Europe. And you can see there's, there's quite a lot of variation here. Um, so there's been quite a lot of focus in terms of understanding what drives those changes, so doing things like the analysis of change here on the right-hand side. Um, and then lastly, uh, this point around embedding um, the new approach in the business as usual. Uh, so focusing on these downstream applications. So I think the one thing I've not mentioned is that we've talked about a lot of challenges, but actually moving to a fair market value basis, having that transparency on what your liabilities actually are and what the, you know, kind of the, the realistic value of those liabilities are, what their sensitivities to market movements, management decisions are, can be really valuable. Um, so again, if, if we look to, to Europe, once everyone had Solvency 2 implemented, they started thinking about, actually, how can I embed this approach in my day-to-day -day management? How can I get the value out of being able to actually you know, see when risk factors change or you know, decisions I make, um, what impact that has on the balance sheet? So. People want to think about, you know, can we embed this in our ORSA process, our business planning processes, where we're actually projecting the whole balance sheet forward through time? Can I do this on a more regular basis? So can I, like, on a daily basis, run a valuation or a solvency valuation or a solvency estimate? Um, and we've mentioned this in challenges just with 
adopting a fair market value approach, when you start overlaying these downstream applications, that obviously then scales up further. So what we see is that even with kind of modern computing, cloud technology, um, we, uh, we still don't really have the compute to run these things brute force. And generally what happens is that insurers are looking to light or proxy model approaches that can capture the estimates close enough, so they still get good estimates, but you know, importantly, are, you know, the key thing to make, make sure of is that you're capturing the right dynamics and sensitivities so that you can understand the implications of market changes or, or you know, changes that you're making, management decisions you're making um, on the balance sheet, and hence have the option to mitigate and manage for those. So, yeah, that was everything I wanted to cover. Um, I think, fortunately, there's been a lot of work done in this in, in other markets, which maybe we can leverage here. Um, but yeah, any further questions, very happy to catch up with people um, offline. Thank you. Thank you, William, for such a good presentation. Please take your seat. Now, I request Mr. Sunny Agrawal to give us a presentation about future of participating business. Please give me a round of applause, please. So, uh, hi everyone, good afternoon. So, going by the uh, theme of the conference this year, uh, marching into the future with responsibility and resilience, it is very important that as a life insurance industry, uh, we don't forget about one of our most old beloved friend, which is the participating portfolio. And in this current session, we are going to cover a, a, in terms of what lies ahead for our participating book in, my, in terms of managing the current portfolio and what can be the possible steps which as an industry we can take for its probable revival. As most of you uh, here may already know, uh, life insurance participating business are savings come insurance products where the customer enjoy a mix of guaranteed income, guaranteed benefits along with a discretionary benefit which is payable uh, in terms of regular bonuses or terminal bonuses and in these uh, regular bonuses can be in the form of addition to summer short or a cash payout to the policyholder. So what has been the performance of participating products in the recent past uh, in the industry? Uh, power products have been one of the most preferred products historically for both the consumers as well as the life insurance industry. In fact, it was the go-to product for LIC, the Life Insurance Corporation of India, the biggest life insurance in the Indian market. In fact, uh, up until uh, the early 2000s, more than 90% of the total new business premium written by LIC was from the participating portfolio itself. But in the recent years, uh, what we have seen that there is a declining trend, both in terms of the contribution, in terms of the absolute figures, and as well as the relative figures. If we were to look at the last five years, where the industry has gone, uh, grown with around a CAGR of 12%, and LIC has grown by a CAGR of 10%. The CAGR for participating book has been only 7% for LIC, which you can see on the right-hand side of the screen as well, where the premium grew from 23,000 crores to around 33,000 crores. But when we talk about the private players, uh, where uh, when we talk about the private players, uh, their contribution to NBAP has actually declined. Uh, we, we have seen a negative CAGR. The private players have grown at a CAGR of 18% in the last five years. But the contribution from power has gone down from 7,600 crores to 6,700 crores uh, in the last financial year. This can be also seen from the contribution of power to the total NBAP. For private players, it was around 22% in FY 16, 17 which has gone down to 11% in FY2122. LIC has been quite fairly stable, which they were around almost 60% in all the last six financial years. So this uh, low demand has actually also contributed that insurance companies have also started moving away from power. And it, this can be seen in terms of the products launched. Only 41 products were launched, uh, contributing to the total uh, proportion of 13% in FY's uh, 
18 to 23, that's the last six years. Whereas in the four years uh, preceding to that, we had around 25% products coming from PAR, which was around 128 products. So clearly the trends shown that both the consumers as well as the industry is preferring less of PAR. So PAR brings its own uh, set of challenges, its own set of difficulties, both from the consumer as well as the uh, insurance company point of view. From a customer point of view, the lack of awareness, the lack of transparency is something uh, which is still there. The customers don't understand PAR that well. They don't understand the bonus philosophy of how and what they can expect in terms of their regular bonuses, what causes their bonuses to change that is still not known to the customers. And in this digital world where the customers are used to uh, see their investment uh, class or investment portfolio on a regular basis, PAR doesn't give them the required transparency of how their fund is moving, how their maturity value is moving, and how their maturity value can change with the changing scenarios. From an insurance company point of view, uh, PAR has a complex administration. Uh, there are a lot, many regulations and guidelines which needs to be referred while managing the participating portfolio. And even if there are guidelines, these are recommended practices. So there is a lot of subjectivity involved when we are managing the power business. This can be also seen in terms of the uh, difference in the internal documentation which is maintained by various companies for managing their power products. The different companies have different asset share methodology. They have different uh, methodology of how much to give in terms of the regular bonuses, how much to give in terms of the terminal bonuses. Treatment of estate and power fund in case of a runoff, it is quite new for the Indian industry. But yes, this is, uh, difficulty or this challenge has started to emerge for some of the players. Then the volatile economic environment add to it in terms of, although the interest rate are quite high at the recent times, but in the past, the volatility in the interest rate has meant that uh, insurers are facing it difficult to give the required guarantees to ensure that the previous bonuses which they have declared in the past are up to the same level for the current policy holders as well. Talking about the challenges, one particular challenge uh, which we have started to emerge in the Indian market is the management of wet profit fund in case of a runoff. When we say runoff, it is the fund has uh, become close to the new business and the remaining power fund needs to be distributed to the current policy holders. The situation is not so prevalent in the Indian market, but in the developed market, particularly the UK, most of the funds have uh, now in a runoff stage because UK market faced a similar situation where earlier power was sold in an aggressive manner because of the higher interest rate, because of the tax relief. But uh, with time, as interest rates started to decline, the tax relief was removed. Uh, insurers find it difficult to meet the guarantees. The guarantees started to bite. The customer lost, lost its trust on the part business because the bonus is declared. So uh, the, in case of a runoff, there are challenges. And on the left-hand side, we have highlighted some of the key risks. Market risk, non-time risk, expenses, and the other operational risk. Market risk in the sense that uh, PAR is a ring fence fund, and any uh, distribution from the estate becomes a part of the PRE, right? So changing an investment strategy of a previous uh, declared bonuses, uh, which was declared on a previous investment strategy, is a challenge for the insurance company. At the same time, uh, PAR is not like a ULIP book where the entire market is being uh, borne by the policyholders. The, some of the market risk remains with the company in terms of meeting the guarantees which was previously declared. So the companies need to hold a capital to manage this market risk as well. Tontine risk is one of the uh, specific risks to the power book where there is a risk that a major proportion of the fund will be distributed to a small number of policyholders. This is true for funds which are close to new business. This is true where the policyholders, the num in terms of the numbers, have uh, gone significantly low. But the uh, remaining power fund, the undistributed surplus, is of a very high amount. And to distribute this amount in a fair and equ uh, equitable manner to the current policyholder uh, has been a challenge for some of the insurers. Expenses, uh, as the fund starts growing smaller, uh, the volatility in expenses to ensure that uh, fair, uh, there is fair allocation of expenses, managing the per policy expenses uh, is a major concern area for some of the insurers because there are uh, regulations of how much you can load into your power fund, uh, 
how much you can load over and above your uh, pricing loaded expenses. So this is a concern for uh, some of the insurance now in India as well. On the right hand side, we have uh, highlighted some of the possible solutions of how these uh, management of the power fund in case of a runoff can be managed. This is not a single solution. This is not an exhaustive solution. As we know, this estate has been created by most of the policyholders who are no longer part of the power fund. And to provide any benefit to the current policyholder will be kind of a windfall. So a single approach will not be justified. So there may be several approaches which needs to be taken to ensure that the distribution of the uh, remaining fund is in a justified manner. Some of the solutions can be in terms of managing the expenses, outsourcing of the administration services to keep a check on the expenses we are incurring on the power fund. When most of the insurers are managing their uh, power fund in case of a runoff, they forget about the customers. So ensuring that there is effective and efficient communication to the customers in terms of what they can expect from their power fund, what different uh, bonus options can be there in case of different scenarios, uh, how is the bonus philosophy determined? To, uh, what is the investment strategy? Of course, there is a discretion which is uh, enjoyed by the insurance company. But at the same time, customers want to be ensured that the objective for which they have taken the participating products is being met by their current policy. In terms of managing the market risk, uh, the uh, duration-wise matching of assets, or investment into a secure fund, but at the same time ensuring that there is enough liquidity because policyholder behavior will play a big role when a fund uh, enters into a runoff stage. Policyholder may be driven to the fact that uh, they might look to uh, withdraw from the policy once they think that their guarantees are in the money. So to ensure that there is enough liquidity, we will need to ensure that there is a right mix between how much security I want uh, and how much extra returns I need to gather from my participating fund. In terms of the bonus strategy, there can be a regular review of bonus strategy, but uh, any regular review may then may mean that we are moving away from the concept of smoothing of returns. Uh, customer will not want that their bonuses are fluctuating uh, year on year and on a very uh, frequent intervals. So all of these solutions uh, is something which is can be done uh, given the current guidelines, given the current regulations. The last solution which we have highlighted here, it is subject to the regulatory approval, it is subject to a discussion with the regulator as well, and has been seen in the uh, UK market as well, where we have seen that there can be a possible conversion of the power fund into a non-power fund or a ULIP fund, where the companies can ensure that all the participating fund becomes uh, a non-power pol policy with a guaranteed benefit. This will reduce their monitoring, this will reduce most of their headache in terms of ensuring that there is uh, smoothing, there is uh, fair distribution of the uh, undistributed surplus. Or there can be a uh, spin-off as well for, to the power, of the power fund, wherein a particular company might think of spinning off their entire power fund to another player who might be more mature, who might be more, who may be still writing their power fund. So it may become very easy for them to manage their participating book instead of a company who thinks that power is out of favor for them now. When we are talking about the future of participating book, uh, we will have to keep an eye on IFRS 17. Uh, it is one of the key areas where uh, insurers are now focusing. Uh, in India, it has started uh, uh, as a hot conversation for the insurers in the developed market. It is already there. So under IFRS 17, uh, as we may know that uh, IFRS uh, with profit products may be uh, measured under the variable free approach. But there are certain decisions, there are certain uh, consideration in the IFRS 17, which will bring some sort of challenges. Uh, these are the aggregation, profit recognition, and treatment of estate. When we talk about aggregation, uh, under IFRS 17, we know that uh, we need, need to uh, divide our policies into different cohorts, depending on the risk type, depending on the uh, underwriting year, depending on the profitability. But if we were to uh, distribute our power fund uh, into various products, do we, uh, are we following the pooling concept, which is the underlying principle of participating fund, where 
intergenerational profit intergenerational profit sharing is also there again in terms of the profit recognition uh, in uh, under IFRS 17 uh, the concept of CSM ensures that there is a smooth flow of uh, profit in the PNL statement so can IFRS 17 result in a confusing concept of entity equity wherein the PNL profit may be uh, not which will be actually allocated to the shareholder but the ultimate uh, profit which will be shared by the shareholder will be again dependent on the bonuses with, with, and they will get the shareholder transfer which is the one by uh, tenth of the total surplus. And the treatment of estate. Right now, uh, estate has been kept as a separate fund. Uh, the undistributed surplus has been maintained uh, year on year by the companies. But under IFRS 17, the fulfillment cash flows, which is the future liability, needs to take into account any benefits which will be payable to the current policyholders as well as the future policyholders. So we may need to ensure that, that in case of estate, your FCF take into account ex complete exhaustion of the fund, whether it is a closed fund or whether it's an open fund. The last slide, here we are going to cover uh, what can be the possible steps for the resurgence of the power book. Uh, any steps uh, will also bring some challenges because resurgence in, will not going to be very easy. Uh, as we were talking that uh, some of the funds has uh, moved into a runoff state. So, and the insurers have started distributing the estate. So as the, we start distributing the estate, there will be almost low or no capital left to fund a new business. And even the shareholders may not be open for any capital injection because the margins have been quite low in terms of the participating business. So when we talk about revival of the portfolio, do we have enough capital left once we enter into a run of state to, for the resurgence of the portfolio? In terms of uh, providing uh, options to the policyholder, the idea will be to give the maximum benefit the most uh, in, in terms of the guaranteed returns, in terms of the bonuses, in terms of the transparency and the information which will be disclosed to the customers. But what can be provided in an economical way is still be a concern for uh, the life insurers. And investment choices are also there. Uh, customers now have a lot more investment choices. The, the digital world has uh, enabled them to invest into stocks and invest into mutual fund, have, uh, invest into derivatives. So will PAR going to fulfill their uh, objective in terms of a higher return, in terms of a return which is equitable to the market? Uh, that is something uh, which we need to consider when we are talking about resurgence. In terms of the possible solutions, uh, any resurgence needs to be borne by a customer demand. And when we say customer demand, can we look into some product innovation? Uh, can we look into uh, participating products in, on a retirement uh, fund? Can we look into, it, into a uh, group platform as well? This is uh, happening with the CDC scheme, the Collective Defined Contribution Scheme, wherein uh, the pension schemes are running with a mixture of guaranteed returns as well as the freedom of uh, getting some better returns in terms of the investment choices. Or can we provide additional flexibility to the customers? Uh, so can the customers for a single product look into a option wherein, wherein they can define how much guarantee they want? I, if a customer wants higher guarantee versus a lower discretionary benefit or vice versa, can we provide that flexibility to the customers? Can we provide flexibility in terms of the bonuses which they want to receive in terms of if a customer wants higher terminal bonus, he, he or she is not concerned with how much regular bonus their policy is earning. Can we provide a, that particular flexibility to the customers? And since we are already in a high interest rate scenario, so can we start providing meaningful guarantees to the customer as well? So all of these can be done on a product innovation side. When we talk about revival, uh, there may be a need for the industry to come as a whole. There may be a need that we may want some assistance from the regulator as well, wherein we can we look for some relaxation in terms of the relaxation in the 9010 rule, relaxation in treatment of the power fund once the companies have declared the BI defined bonus rates. So this is something which we need to consider. So as I end my session, uh, the concept of power is a strong concept. It has been uh, one of the preferred products it, uh, for most of the insurers in the past. But as we move into the future, we may not want to go with the traditional power products, and we may want to look at some of the 
possible choices which we have given here or maybe some other choices. I will leave it up to you of how you look at these opinions and views. Thank you so much. So very correctly summed up, I will again reiterate the uh, comments of member actually in the earlier session. It's not that power products are not good, but I think more management is required to ensure. But I would like to give a small scenario. Before 1992, when even SEBI was not in existence and investment market was not there, a farmer living in a village, if he want to take a 50,000 cover, will he not be happy to pay premium for 50,000 sum assured to LIC having the safe return that he will get 50,000 after 10, 15 years, which will help him considering he is a farmer. Now, because technologies have come, security market has come, and we are able to compare returns between ULIP, security market, we can say. But as member actually, sir, has mentioned in the first half, that there is lot of improvement that can be done in case of participating product. I know that we are running behind time, and I have some questions on the Slido. So what I will do, I will pick up one question each from each subject. So first question is to Mr. Sunny. I have received, do you envisage future Indian power products with clearly defined benefits given the requirements under IFRS 17 for VFA? Let me repeat the question. Yeah, please. Please see the question, last one, and answer it. Uh, so to answer this question, uh, I guess IFRS 17 will have its own complexity in terms of the measurement, in terms of uh, measurement the operational complexity. Uh, yes, uh, it's not the case that it is only for power. There are complexities for non-power products as well. The current uh, power products with clearly defined benefits can be uh, considered under IFRS 17. Uh, we may want to look at uh, how we can uh, divide the current power fund into various uh, risk type, into various cohorts. But at the same time, we may want to stick to our uh, concept of uh, ensuring that the bonuses, because uh, if there were to be any change in terms of the distribution of surplus, that has to be taken into consideration as well if you were to uh, club IFRS 17 with the management of power fund, if the 9010 rules uh, remains the same, if, if the distribution of estate to different generation of policyholders remains the same, then we will have to look at in a uh, consolidated manner. We, we, we cannot look at into segregated funds. But yes, there might be other changes which may be required uh, if we were to look at, at power only from an IFRS 17 perspective. Okay, thank you. So we'll move quickly to the next question. This is Mr. William. For interest rate shock calibration, which approach, empirical or simulation, would be more precise in Indian interest rate contest? Uh, okay, yeah, thank you. So I think in, in the context of calibrating the, the, the validation model that we were talking about, um, ideally, if you can source swaption quotes, um, that's what we try and use because they're forward-looking. It's we know that that's market consistent because it's what the market is pricing. Um, if there isn't, or you can't source swaption quotes, then we can potentially look at some of the historical data to try and inform what a forward-looking volatility might look like. Um, so yeah, I think that's the, the, short, the short answer. So I, uh, I have some more questions, but I suggest that if you have some more questions, you can get in touch with these people during breaks and ask, I have some more questions, but I won't be able to take them because of paucity of time. So once again, I would like to thank to both of you and also to the audience. We, I think we mitigated the risk in a way that we started early, so lesser people were there. And by the time the hall was full, we have finished more than 80% of our presentation. It's also one of the way of mitigating the risk and of getting last. So you may try this trick to start your presentation on time. You will get lesser question. Thank you very much. Now I request Mr. Pankaj to present token of appreciation to our speakers.
Now I request Mr. B. R. Rangarajan to come on stage to present token of appreciation to Mr. Pankaj. Our next session is a panel discussion for 45 minutes. I request everyone to scan the Slido QR code to post your questions for this session. The topic for the panel discussion is the DB pension renewed emergence, a boom or a bane. Let's join the discussion with our session chair, Mr. Himanshu Jain, who is a lead actuary at Mercer India, along with our panel, Mr. Shashi Krishnan, CEO of NPS Trust India, Mr. Andrew Peterson, Managing Director in International Society of Actuaries US. Mr. Jayesh Dharminder Pandit, Principal Consultant at KA Pandit Consultant and Actuaries India. Mr. Ritoprita Sarkar, Head of Retirement and Partner at Willis Towers in India. Mr. Sashi, Mr. Ritu, Mr. Jain, Mr. Andrew, good afternoon. Good afternoon, audience. Uh, thanks uh, for joining in. Uh, our session now is on the topic of uh, renewed emergence for DB schemes, uh, whether it's a boon or a bane. Uh, for the benefit of audience, let me start by sharing a very brief uh, uh, introduction about these DB schemes. Uh, so essentially, uh, between a government or a sit or its citizen, or mostly between an employer and an employee, uh, if they commit a benefit that is to be paid in future, uh, usually with subject to certain eligibility criteria or certain uh, conditions, uh, we say such kind of long-term benefits are defined benefit in nature. Uh, essentially, the volatility that exists in these benefits, like how much benefit will be paid, uh, when it will be paid, and whether it will be paid for uh, wh what, what period of time, all these uh, volatilities and risks are, are for the sponsor of the scheme, which is the government or the employer. Uh, a cousin or a brother of this uh, kind of benefit is a defined contribution scheme, uh, where the commitment from the sponsor is only to pay a certain amount of fixed contribution during the person's working lifetime and they look to uh, put that in, it in a kitty where uh, that fund grows. And what the individual gets is the final value of that uh, uh, investment pot at the time of uh, retirement. So from the perspective of this session, we'll be uh, looking to discuss with our panel who have these expertise in these retirement benefits, uh, three key aspects. Uh, the first would be we'll look to understand the trends that exist now that can uh, uh, boost the emergence of these retiral benefits, I would say, not specifically DB or a DC scheme. Uh, then we look at uh, the adequacy part of these schemes. So from an individual perspective, whether such schemes can give a meaningful benefit and what kind of uh, uh, planning they should do in each kind of uh, scheme so that they can uh, have the target retiral uh, pension for them. Uh, and lastly, we'll see uh, both these schemes, defined benefit or defined contributions, are in existence for many decades now. So uh, there's, in my personal view, there's no perfect system. Uh, so there's always uh, something that we can learn from the past. So from sustainability perspective, how these schemes can be designed or how these schemes can be monitored, that we'll look to discuss with our uh, panel. So let me start by, uh, I think, asking our panel uh, their views on maybe top one or two trends that they are seeing in the market that uh, helps the re-emergence of these schemes, whether it is a defined benefit or defined contribution basis, you're not good. So maybe if we could have one or two thoughts from each of you. Maybe we can start with you, Andy. Thank you. 
I think in, in um, I'm, I'm going to present more from a global perspective because I'm not an expert on India, so let me just say that up front. And particularly my experience before in my international role with the Society of Actuaries was uh, uh, working for many years as a consultant with what is now WTW, but a prior iteration, and then also working 10 years with the Society of Actuaries on retirement issues. Um, I guess the trend from what I see is, is at least in a, in a U.S. context, but, but more broadly, for those who are in defined contribution plans where they've been accumulating large amounts of money or a pot of money, is how do you decumulate that money? And so what are the options? Obviously, as actuaries, we think about annuities and those sorts of things, but in many countries, either there isn't a deep annuity market or there's a reluctance from many people to actually commit their money to that for a long period of time. So I think um, actuaries and a lot of uh, different uh, plan design experts are really looking at creative ways of how you take that money, how you help people with that decumulation process, whether it is through a series of annuities or different uh, approaches to doing that. So that's, I think, a big um, uh, issue in, in today's markets. Uh, from, from the Indian perspective, uh, what I believe is the, who is there looking at it? Like if uh, from, from the employees' perspective, they are all looking at a DB, DB scenario ca coming back. Uh, from the employer's perspective, uh, they want to reduce their cost, so they are looking at a DC, case, DC scenario uh, going forward. And uh, from the government perspective, they want to reduce their uh, liability. So how to balance uh, uh, between DB and DC, that's what, uh, uh, what is the Indian scenario. And which is also guided by the tax treatment, what is, uh, what is there for the contribution. So all mixed uh, put together, the Indian scenario is, uh, you can say, bifurcated between who is looking at uh, what, like uh, whether it's an employee, uh, he would uh, go for DB, employer would go for DC. Yeah, I, I, I would tend to agree with uh, some of the comments, but I, I, do, I do see that the trends are quite con conflicting, as Jess yes, uh, yes, yes, uh, just mentioned. Uh, so the trend from DB to DC continues in India. It has been the case for the last few years. The most recent example of such a trend is in the exempt provident fund space. Uh, we still have around a thousand such uh, funds in India. And we, we gradually see that those funds are going back to the, to the EPFO, uh, primarily because of the risks attached uh, to, to providing the guaranteed uh, interest rate. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you, you have a situation uh, about this recent judgment where uh, people have been given an option to, to take a defined benefit pension in exchange for a lump sum, right? So, so again, it's a reverse trend to some extent, but it's also driven by uh, the, 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 the judiciary or regulatory changes rather than an actual trend uh, driven by employers and employees. Uh, from an occupational uh, pension standpoint and from a voluntary pension standpoint, uh, we clearly see the emergence of NPS as the most popular choice as far as uh, employers are concerned. Uh, but the you know, the take-up rate, you know, because it's, it, it's generally provided as a, as a voluntary plan uh, and it's carved out of the CTC of, of employees. Uh, so it, the take-up rate is still, uh, you know, still about 10 or 11 percent nationally, uh, which is uh, still very, very low from an overall, uh, uh, you know, uh, adequacy standpoint. But even there, I, would, I think the conflicting trend is uh, what Mr. Bondupadhyay said in the morning, that uh, you know, from a gov you know, from a from a government's political agenda perspective, I think the trend is to sort of uh, uh, give give people an option to go back to the old uh, DV re regime. Mr. Sachi. Yeah, I don't want to join in to the debate which Rithropata and JS you know sort of mentioned regarding you know DV and DC, uh, but I, I see four trends. I mean, which in, in the Indian context. And I think the first trend is this increasing need for inclusivity. I think, you know, pensions have been exclusive. 
we are a population of 130 crore people, and uh, in the NPS, we have six crore subscribers. Maybe you add on you know, the EPF and the rest, you may end up with you know, 10 or 12 crore subscribers. So there is an increasing conversation about inclusivity and how could we make pension available to all? And I think this is a serious conversation which reads you know, design, actually, rather than anything else. And if we don't find that design in this room, I don't know where we will find that design. That's one. Two is that there is this increasing sort of pressure from the government to move to what we call the new tax regime. Uh, and that's where Jayesh mentioned this issue about people putting aside money for retirement or pensions because they are taxed advantage. And the government's intent is very, very clear that we want to move into a tax, new tax regime where we lower your taxes, but we don't give you tax advantage schemes. And in that context, how do you then position pensions? I mean, it, it is going to be you know, something that you need to uh, position on its own. So those are two broad trends I see. But if you look at specifically NPS, there are two more trends I see. One is that NPS has now been open to the citizens, and we're seeing an increasing pickup and take on uh, in the citizens getting into NPS, and it's no longer sort of identified as something that only the government employees would be looking at. And that number is very big. In fact, if I looked at the January numbers, we actually have a swap. There are more individual subscribers and corporate subscribers than we have government subscribers now, which is a very, very sort of interesting trend. And the last trend that I noticed is there is an increasing move to move out of default schemes. And that's where the sustainability is going to come in because what happens is if you don't get your asset allocation right, you'll never get your sort of uh, replacement rates and your sustainability. And I think I see an increasing trend in even those who are offered default schemes to move towards active asset allocation. Great points, I think, everyone. Uh, so I think, Ritu, you mentioned about the new uh, employee pension not new, but the changes that are proposed for the employee pension scheme under EPFO and the recent regulations uh, that have started coming in post the Supreme Court uh, uh, order. So uh, my two questions over here, and I would like you and Mr. Jayesh to respond, is uh, with these recent changes uh, as in subscriber for uh, the Provident Fund scheme, I have a choice. So what would be your recommendation from an actual perspective? What kind of uh, factors uh, individual subscribers should look at that will help me take a decision? Because maybe the uh, selection by me could have a different uh, circumstances versus the uh, other person. And then uh, uh, because under the, under the uh, suggested regime, the amount of pension that a person would get would significantly increase. So can that be the only solution which a person should look at to manage their post-retirement income or they should continue to look for more avenues so to ensure that uh, they have a sustainable pension? No, thanks, Himanshu. Uh, so, uh, so I think firstly, uh, there needs to be more awareness about the EPS uh, as, as, as a scheme. I, I think the general awareness of that scheme in the country is, is uh, very poor at this, uh, at this point in time, especially because the amount of pension that you get out of that is 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 really small. Um, so so I think people, you know, subscribers, you know, six crore subscribers that we are talking about, uh, maybe seventy percent are eligible to exercise this option uh, in a very short period of time, which which is also making things quite challenging. Uh, uh, you know, for it, it's for them to understand firstly how the formula is going to work. Uh, we still don't know uh, the, the final computation uh, method, which hopefully will, will be announced fairly soon. Uh, but, but firstly, the financial aspect of it, uh, which today, as it stands, uh, it, it does guarantee a better value uh, for, for someone who, who elects that option. Uh, but that's not the entire story, right? I mean, when you are making an option, when you're selecting something which is likely to hold good for the next 20 years, there are a lot of other qualitative aspects that you need to keep in mind. You know, one is the preference of lump sum versus uh, a, a guaranteed pension. Uh, and I think in India, we still have a, um, a, a, a great desire for a return on capital kind of product. Uh, 
uh, which unfortunately the EPS does not provide today as an option. So, so that, that becomes a very important uh, consideration. The second thing is obviously tax. Uh, as it stands today, it's still an exempt, exempt, exempt regi uh, regime in the EPF. So the lump sum get you that you get is tax-free. Although when you get the lump sum, you're going to invest it somewhere, and, and it's quite likely that it, you know, that return is going to be taxed. But then the pension is completely, you know, there's no tax break available at all. Uh, so that's an another point. And thirdly, obviously, it's personal preferences, uh, you know, the risks at attached to it. Uh, you know, th there is a risk of government changing the rules of a defined benefit scheme in the future. So all of those things have to be taken into consideration. I think uh, I agree with uh, Ritu, uh, but uh, from the per perspective of a sub subscriber, uh, what uh, one uh, could look at it is uh, that it's a uh, uh, force saving. So. Uh, even the whatever may be the benefit which is going because uh, uh, what has been observed that uh, people like uh, lump sum but uh, they tend to withdraw pf much uh, uh, much early in the uh, before the retirement so there is hardly a saving remaining uh, post retirement so this uh, and pension uh, the cps cannot be withdrawn so uh, from from the subscriber perspective from a social perspective it would be an advantage that it's a force saving. So that, that's one thing a uh, uh, subscriber can look at it. As we are discussing that DB uh, internationally is being costly. And uh, as per the current circular which has come, uh, the, the benefits are not guaranteed. And they have said that the benefit can uh, be uh, varied retrospectively uh, depending on the contribution which comes in. So one has to... Uh, be sure or take a chance of whether they are the benefit what is expected today may not come in future, but considering the force saving, it may be a better perspective. Sure, thank you. Uh, Mr. Sashi, my next question is for you, and I'll take cues from uh, the trends that you have mentioned, the inclusive, inclusivity part and the default option which people have. Uh, so under NPS, we know that uh, as a subscriber, uh, I have to make choices. Uh, the risk that I have uh, as a subscriber uh, exists in two phases. One, when I'm accumulating my wealth with NPS, and second, when I'll be using that wealth for my pension. Uh, and those choices are sometimes very hard for a person who is not very financially uh, equipped, uh, uh, the financial education wise is not very equipped. So what are your suggestions how a subscriber can look to make these choices? Uh, let's say they are not going ahead with the default option. So what kind of uh, support in the existing system or in future you look NPS can provide to a subscriber? Yeah, so just to step back a little bit, I think we have very little understanding of what pension adequacy means in this country. So if you talk to a government employee, he thinks it's 50% of my last drawn pay, you know, and then adjusted for all inflation, uh, wage increases, etc., for the rest of how long I live. You talk to an, somebody in the unorganized sector who is on Atul Pension Yojana, it's 5,000 rupees. How adequate is that? I don't know. So I think the first and biggest challenge is to sort of sit down and try and figure out what is pension adequacy for a country like ours, which has, you know, got income disparity, demographics, that is so very wide. And that's going to be one of the bigger challenges. But if you really want to get him to you know, figure out where he wants to go, as you rightly said, there are choices. right? And one is obviously these choices will determine the return that you get on your investments. Right? We have this default scheme. Uh, the default scheme has been sort of designed possibly with an intent to reduce risk and not to sort of uh, maximize investments. And that's the way we normally would tend to, you know, design such sort of schemes, I suspect, because, you know, everybody who designs it doesn't want to take the risk of, you know, having to answer as to why, you know, you expose somebody to hire. The bigger problem is in terms of the exit, because there aren't enough options at the time of exit. And, I mean, with all of you guys who design these annuity products, I mean, I, I would like to sort of suggest that we really need to look at this space, uh, I mean, 
uh, with a with a lot more sort of uh, uh, sort of seriousness. Uh, I mean, you could say that uh, you know it is an annuity for life, but does that annuity for life re result in a stream of income that sort of supports your sort of lifestyle after that? Uh, is a question that none of us have answered. Uh, as he was rightly sa saying right in the beginning, uh, you know, you could give people the option of taking out all their money, right? Or, or you could give the p uh, person an option of withdrawing it systematically, which I think many jurisdictions across the world do allow. But what is going to be the efficacy of these options in a country like ours, we really don't know, because we've seen in PF, for example, 90% of the money tends to get withdrawn before people even sort of reach that age of superannuation, right? And I think uh, the English uh, sort of experience seems to suggest that even when you're allowing systematic withdrawals over time, sometimes it isn't adequate. So I think there is a lot of design that we need to do out there, even at the exit stage. Great, thank you. Uh, I think taking cue from your response, uh, most of these retiral benefit schemes uh, we say are long-term in nature and there's another aspect of that long-term is that the success or failure of that scheme, whether it is able to accomplish the uh, aim with which it was created, can only be known after many years from now. So uh, my question is to all of you to share your views on, uh, as a uh, trustee or as a sponsor, what kind of monitoring mechanisms can be built in so that you do not wait for those years to pass on and then realize that, okay, probably this, these are some of the interventions we would have made during the lifetime of the scheme. And uh, that can help run the scheme more sustainably and provide adequate benefits to the in intended participants. So maybe again, Andy, if we start with you. Well, if, we, if we switch back maybe to the defined benefit concept in, in thinking through those, that question, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of challenges there, but I think there's kind of two main levers, right? One is on the desi design side. How do you design the benefits? How rich are they are? All of that sort of aspect. And then the other is on the funding side. As actuaries, I hope that we're both experts in both sides um, because they, they, they both work together so, so, so integrally. But um, particularly on the funding side, I mean, I think as, as, as the work we do, um, you know, we need to make sure that from a funding side that, that we're uh, making sure we have adequate funding with our, whether it's a government sponsoring the program, which creates its own unique moral hazards and political risk, or whether it's a, a corporation um, funding it. Um, my experience is usually the corporations are a little easier to deal with the political risk, but they're not real interested in dealing with, with the risk in general, right? Um, but just the idea that, that you need to have, as actuaries, we need to have appropriate assumption setting, right? I mean, th there's been big debates in certain jurisdictions, particularly the U.S., about what even are the right assumption bases to use when you're measuring that long-term basis. Do you use market rates? Do you use other sort of assumed long-term rates of return based on what a risky portfolio might suggest you could earn over long term. Well, that doesn't take into account the risk, right? So, so what are the appropriate measurements and assumptions to use? And how do you stress test that through a range of economic conditions? Obviously, you can sort of have a best estimate set of assumptions, but if you work your way through, you know, the last, uh, you know, a 2008 crisis or, or even the, the, the the, the impact of the last several years of the pandemic and what that's done to asset values and the, the ups and downs, those are all things you need to think about. In addition, then there's just the whole question of intergener intergenerational equity of how, how are you, particularly, and this is more an issue in the government-sponsored programs, if it is a, you know, a funded system, how do you make sure that the benefits that are being accrued or earned today are also being paid for today so that the younger generations aren't getting saddled with benefit uh, costs and, and expenses from people who are finished working 20 years ago. And so there's no easy answers to those issues, but as the actual profession, we are the ones who should be focused on that. And so there are certainly principles that you can apply in that case and think about of how best to um, respond to those, how to fund programs over 
you know, future lifetimes, not, not long 30, 40, 50 year periods, but over the period that people are actually working and just different aspects around, around those issues. And those, I, I, that's just one aspect. I know we can talk about the dis defined contribution bit, but let me just stop there and let others go. Basically, if, uh, DB uh, from the perspective of how you be managing when one is design, uh, whether what, what benefit you are going to give, whether uh, it's sustainable. Uh, that's that's one part. Second part is how it is funded. Like, uh, I, if we look at it, funding not not of the investment part of it, but. Uh, uh, say, say for example, for any any uh, salary escalation or any salary revision, if pension cost is considered and that's uh, deducted out of the CTC which is given, and then, then it's funded. So uh, it's actually coming out of uh, benefit uh, from the employer, and the cost cost is minimized. So how we still fund your scheme uh, as far as investment goes, or as far as your uh, uh, you. Uh, yearly contribution goes and who is contributing that would take take care of uh, what is the burden on the employer and uh, so government also being an employer if government is also doing the same thing then then it's to maintain so that's that's how uh, uh, one could uh, look at db being part of a dc or uh, converting that into a hybrid dc so i think in terms of uh Continuous monitoring, uh, you know, obviously we'll have to review the, the assumptions uh, every few years. I think a lot of the, uh, the DB schemes that were set up in India uh, in the 60s and 70s, uh, they would target a 50 to 60 percent net replacement ratio. Uh, but, but the design, you know, the way the, 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 these schemes had been set up, I think, I think we are looking at a very different uh, economic uh, situation at that point in time. I mean, I mean, I remember when I started off, the, you know, we used to use salary escalation rates of four to five uh, percent, and and interest rates of 10, 10, 11 percent, right? So, and this is this is 20 years back. So maybe 30, 40 years back, it was even 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 more prevalent to use such such rates. But but I think the 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 challenge is that sometimes we can't can't even take one shock in the system, right? So every time, you know, I remember interest rates in 2003 uh, dropped from 10, 11% levels to 5, 6% levels uh, in a very short period of time, which obviously led to a massive increase in, in annuity rates uh, that LIC used to provide at that point in time. And there were like, you know, at least 20 or 25 very reputed British organizations that used to have those uh, pension schemes. They, they almost you know, converted all of the DB schemes to DC in a, in a matter of two years. So it's always been like a one or a zero kind of an approach, but I, I think if you continue to monitor this, uh, both from a design perspective as well as from a funding perspective, uh, I, I think we, we can still sort of save DB plans uh, to, to some extent and not com you know, convert everything into a DC. And the people who then converted 20 years back who are retiring now, are, are probably getting you know half of what was originally promised to them, so so that's one aspect on the design side and on the funding side, as Andy mentioned, I think there's more need for uh, you know matching of liabilities and assets in India. I, I think we we generally don't give importance to uh, asset liability matching at all, uh, and and therefore again, any any time there's a shock, interest rates drop, uh, the liabilities increase, the assets don't increase. So I, th I think there's quite a bit of work that can be done on that front, and perhaps that can help help us still uh, maintain a balance between uh, DB and DC. Uh, so just to take off from where Ritalbhata left off, whose responsibility is it to ensure that this happens? You know, that's I think a question we need to sit back in in the Indian context. So, like for example, in the in the NPS. We have a board of trustees. In the EPFO, we have a board of trustees. And we need to sort of then point out to say that, you know, you are responsible for these kind, these set of things. And the first and most important thing I believe that they are responsible for is the subscriber risk. Because there are risks, unfortunately, in a pension ecosystem that actually happen at three stages. 
One is in the accumulation phase. And in the accumulation phase, uh, you have, you call it volatility, you call it uncertainty, uh, whatever it is, but you have volatility of returns, uncertainty of returns, and what you do need to do for at least the investor's interest, the subscriber's interest, is to dampen that down as far as you can. Coupled with, obviously, the ALM risks which you were talking about, which I think uh, not too many of us pay much attention to. But I think there are two more big risks which I see. One is the fact that at the time you superannuate, there is a very big risk because you are force advertising a lot of people in this country, right? You're not giving them choices. I mean, we in the NPS system have tried to sort of mitigate that by allowing people the options of continuing or deferring. But in most schemes, you don't have that choice. And if you're force advertising somebody, you actually are not allowing him to you know, take a, 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 an appropriate decision, in my opinion. And you really need to figure out how do you get over this. And the third and obvious problem, which I think uh, everybody in this room is uh, seized off, is that uh, most of us still have you know, fixed annuities. In this country, at least, that's what we go with. And therefore, that's something that we need to look at and say, how do we make this space a little more subscriber friendly? You know? Do we have options that we can give him that sort of protect his, you know, because longevity risk is something that you guys will take care of, but at least, you know, the uh, sort of post-retirement risks need to be taken off. I mean, over and above that, I think two, three other things which come to my mind. One is clearly the uh, costs, right? The investment management costs, I think, is clearly a responsibility that we as trustees to these funds need to, you know, look at very carefully and ensure that you know, over a 36-year period, that's the normal amount of time a government employee or a you know, corporate employee spends in life. You know, any decrease in cost that you can bring about will just add to the kind of corpuses that he can build. And I think we owe our subscribers uh, that responsibility. And lastly, I think uh, you know, uh, subscriber education, that becomes very, very important because uh, if you look at it, uh, you have a set of people who are sort of self-selectors. They will decide for themselves what's the kind of risk they want, what's the kind of asset allocation they want, how do they build up their corpus. But, I mean, the number of self-selectors actually, I mean, effective self-selectors are actually very, very few in the system. And you normally need guided selection, if you ask me. And I don't think we build up capabilities to sort of get that guided se selection. We don't have advisors in this place. Uh, in place to do this. I know you do have a lot of, I mean, you know, you have an agency system that is available in the insurance space, in the pension space, but how much of that is guided selection, I don't know, right? So those are my quick thoughts on that. Excellent. I think just one uh, small question on the inflation part. Uh, is NPS looking to uh, uh, offer such kind of uh, inflation-linked annuities in future? Because I think you have the largest pool of funds. So I think when you push the industry to look for such kind of products, definitely the industry will also follow. Yeah. So I think a bit, a bit of a clarification out here, we are an accumulation phase product, right? So what we can do is we can sit down with people like you and persuade you to give us, you know, better products in the annuity phase. Sure. As of today. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so, Andy, uh, my next question is from one of the inputs you shared that uh, a lot of these uh, defined benefit schemes, specifically when they are run by the government, have this intergenerational issue, equity issue. Uh, that's because I think the committed benefits are to be paid or borne by the future generations. Mostly these schemes are pay-as-you-go basis, uh, not funded. Uh, so, and it's a... I think a global problem with a lot of countries, I think, looking to tweak their pension system. Uh, the government is looking to tweak that system because they are seeing, seeing uh, aging population. They are not able to generate sufficient funds to support the past pensioners. So any thoughts on how this could be managed or any solutions that you have seen uh, globally that can give insights on a better management of this sort of a solution? Yeah, I, this is that. That's a tough question. The reality is providing retirement income is expensive, right? And I guess we all know that, but especially the extent that we're experiencing increased longevity, I mean, to think that you're maybe the average, you know, you, you work in the workforce for 30 to maybe 40 years, but it's not unusual then to have another 
25 to 35 years of retirement. I mean, just the thought of how that, you know, how does that work? How can you work, you know, almost be retired as long as you're working or, that, you know, that, that makes retirement a very expensive proposition, right? And, and I think there's a tendency for politicians, of course, to want to minimize that. As actuaries, we need to be the truth tellers in that process of saying this is, these are real costs and you have, to, um, you have to understand that. In addition, then, at the same, you know, that combined with that, you have issues around, um, you know, worker to retiree ratios that are changing. Some of that's due to increased longevity, but some of that's all, also due to fertility changes where, where average fertility is, is going down quite a bit as, as as, um, you know, as, as economies get more developed. I saw some numbers for India where, where the retiree to worker ratio was about 13.8 to 1 in 2000. In 2020, it's about 10.2 to 1. And by 2050, it's going to be 5 to 1. Those are actually really good ratios compared to the rest of the developed world. But when you think about that as a proportion, those are, I mean, that's a pretty rapid going from 10 to 1 down to 5 to 1 over the next 30 years. That's, that's a significant change that India will have to deal with. So what are the answers? I, I think, you know, there's, I don't know if there's any magic answer, but some of what I've seen is, is the type of things where there are automatic balancing mechanisms built into systems, uh, things in, the, in this context primarily more in, in social insurance, social security type systems that are, as you said, pay-as-you-go systems, where you are adjusting retirement ages, assumed retirement ages out based on the average uh, lo longevity increase or life expectancy increase for that particular population. So that's one thing that can work. Um, adjusting the, the amounts of benefits that are actually taxed towards, towards or included as pensionable or, or, or included in that context um, so that higher wages are included even if they're not necessarily included in pensionable income uh, is another, another approach that is being used. Um, but this is, you know, these, these are the really challenging um, uh, situations. I, in the def defined benefit space, I've seen some things where companies are really actually, or, or governments are using more, um, not quite defined benefit. It's mostly defined benefit, but not quite, right? And so if you have, even if you have a little bit of flexibility in changing the benefits, if you have a large enough pool of people and you've got some good uh, adjustment mechanisms built in, you can make small tweaks in advance so that you don't have to deal with these at the end. The challenge, of course, is none of this happens overnight. Retirement, it's like, I mean, a, a, a cyclone hits, that happens right there. You've got this catastrophic loss right there. Retirement, it's just such a, it's like a slow, slow moving train wreck, as we say. And so we as actuaries, again, need to be helping to get ahead of that and, 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 uh, and uh, be the truth tellers in this process. Excellent, thanks. Uh, so I think in interest of time, probably the last question. Uh, we talked about that I think employees always prefer a DB scheme. But I think on the flip side, uh, there's some factors specifically with the new generation that they would look to prefer with D, uh, DC scheme is uh, they get the portability option. Uh, there's also a trend. Uh, Definitely in India that in new age technology companies, employees do not stay for that long that even if that company offers a pension scheme, they could have a meaningful pension or in many situations they may, might not even complete the vesting criteria for that uh, scheme. There's also a trend of freelancing now, so people prefer to work uh, on a consulting basis. So in such a scenario related to the topic of the, uh, our discussion, uh, do you see that uh, DB schemes can make a meaningful uh, comeback, uh, having having the employees maybe having prefer more a DC scheme specifically on the corporate side because of this portability and the uh, period they are expected to stay with an organization. So as a maybe private uh, employer, uh, should I even look at a DB scheme or because of this this scenario, just think offering a better uh, DC scheme or maybe top up the NPS part more. So, uh, your thoughts, then maybe, sir, we can start with you. Well, I strongly believe that uh, you know the future holds only non-career employees. I don't really see you know any move back to career employment. 
I don't think that's the way the world's going to work. I mean, so that's, that's, that's a view I hold, so I'm going to answer that question <laughs> from that perspective. And if you look at, if I answer that question from that perspective, then I think, you know, a, a DC scheme actually is the best option that can be available for any of the, the gig workers, the non-career workers, simply because, you know, portability, the relative flexibility, your ability to choose how much you want to contribute, when you want to contribute. I think that's going to become very important because, you know, there will be times when you decide to, you know, chill and take off and do nothing, right? And then you may not want to contribute, right? Or there may be times when you're sort of working over time and you want to contribute more, so why not? Same is the case with investment choices. There could be times when, you know, life's hard, you don't have a risk appetite, so you say, you know, can I make my investment choices to reflect where I am today? So I would say non-career and DC is the way forward. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I, I think I, I don't think, at least in the short to medium term, I, I don't see a comeback of DB plans uh, globally as well as in India. But having said that, I, th I think we'll also have to look at the Indian context a little bit. And, you know, wherever we, we have DC schemes, it's almost like the employee is paying for that uh, himself or herself because it's all carved out, your, you know, as part of your overall package, right? So I, th I think employers still have a role to play either in terms of matching contributions or topping up that, that DC contribution with some sort of a meaningful uh, sort of floor. If, you know, if, if that could be the way forward, I see that to be more practical than a complete reversal back to the old DB regime. I agree with both, but if at all uh, DB was to be there and the portability, uh, there is a way out like uh, uh, actual factor can be applied to the transfer value and uh, the transfer value becomes an opening corpus of a DC scheme. <clears throat> so that uh, wherever DP, DB schemes are continuing, the portability still remains. So that's my view that uh, DB being the scheme for the worker and if uh, employer is paternistic and offering then the portability by transfer value can continue. I'd agree, just simply say that you do need to think about what kind of employer you are, obviously. Um, I think in a government sector, there's, there's probably a lot more long-tenured employees than you might obviously see in the tech se sector. And so from a, at least historically, we always talked about retirement programs being for retirement, but also being a retention tool for employers. So if, if you take that mindset, is, is there, might there still be opportunities to design your programs, whether DB or DC, keeping in mind that retention aspect and, and uh, competitive aspect as well? Okay. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. I think uh, you've shared excellent points. And to summarize, I think uh, both the systems have their uh, uh, pros and cons that we know. And from an Indian context, I think both the systems can exist. Uh, right now, uh, there is, as we discussed for EPS, there's some uh, clarity which is still required. But I think as that emerged, that could also be a more uh, potential uh, contributed to, to the final retirement savings. Same way, I think, uh, from the government perspective, uh, looking to offer a more sustainable scheme, uh, whether for their own workers or for the citizens as a whole. I think there are a lot of planning, and specifically on the funding side, I think that's the first step. You pay as you go. May look uh, very lucrative initially, but we all know how that uh, uh, liability is blew, uh, blew up pretty soon. So both the systems can coexist, and I think there's a lot more thoughts that can be put in uh, uh, to make this uh, sustainable, and we as actuaries have a lot bigger role to play in that. As Andy said, I think we need to be the truth teller whenever such kind of changes are coming in should, should come forward via this platform and other platforms to talk about uh, the pros and cons. With that, I think, thank you. Uh, over to you. Thanks, Manchu. Thanks, panel, for such an informative session. Now I would request Mr. Himanshu to present token of appreciation to our panelist.
Now I would li like to request Mr. M uh, Mayur Ankolekar to come on stage and present a token of appreciation to Mr. Himanshu. Thank you everyone, let's have some tea and join back in 30 minutes.